growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi everyone, Dr. Steve Rasner here, and welcome back to The Lionhearted Dental Podcast. We all know what a Navy SEAL is, right, when we think about it. We all know what an elite athlete is. Or even recognize businesses that have established themselves above the rest. You know when you make a reservation or you think of having lunch or staying over at a Four Seasons hotel chain, You don't have to wonder what they're about. Everybody knows. So those of you tuning in, maybe for the first time, or maybe you've just tuned in recently, and you're wondering what the Lionhearted Dental Practice is, I'm going to help you define it tonight. Because I'm hoping those of you that have tuned in for the last year or more are pushing toward that type of organization because it's a no-lose situation for you. I can't imagine you following these principles that we share each and every week and having anything but success by doing so. I also want to talk particularly about the lion-hearted new patient experience. Other people refer to that as wow, the wow factor which quite honestly gets on my nerves. It does. There's lectures on it. There's speakers and the title of the program is the wow factor. And I'm probably gonna take a lot of them off by saying that, but because I think it invites pretentious cover up for quality often. Really there is. And listen, I have to back off before I go off on one of my things. And say, look, anybody that tries in earnest to better their organization is doing good stuff. Anybody that represents dentistry, even if I don't agree with it, is doing good things. But I think sometimes we get lost. I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of movements. And when I was a young dentist, there was all kinds of ideas to be successful. Some offices start in the morning with group hugs. Yeah, I said group hugs. Yeah, that'll go a long way towards nothing. Don't get me wrong. I work in an office with 16 other staff members, of which I've told you before, I've been around many of them over 20 years. And I really think they truly care about each other. Some of them even love each other. A few of them may even feel that way about me, but what they do know, whether they love me or not, is that I am absolutely fair, that I am honest, and I am clear in my leadership. So yeah, there was group hugs. There was, I'm just giving you things that kind of sour me when I think of, wow, wow, the patient. Don't worry so much, not that they're saying this. Your clinical expertise can be okay, but wow, the patient with, make sure we all wear the same stuff. We all have the same uniforms on. Or let's put over the top things in our waiting room murals of patients before and afters. It's always the after, of course. Again, I, I've got to be careful on this ground because, first of all, some of you may have that, and I'm not here to tick you off. I'm here to define. I like when I used that expression, Navy SEAL, a few minutes ago. I have such respect for the Green Beret or the Navy SEAL or people that can achieve such high-level performance by hard work and preparation. And that is 
what I hope the final product is of a lion-hearted dental office. Because it's not going to be an office that anybody will ever say, man, they're full of, you know what? That would be the worst thing you could say about me or any of the principles that I impart to you. They very well may say they're too expensive or I just want my tooth fixed and for goodness sakes, this doctor wanted me to think about comprehensive oral health. Shame on him. I'm fine with my 14 overfilled teeth being amalgam or composites with constant leakage. I mean, it doesn't hurt. And he said, we'll watch that. We can watch that. By the way, I do watch things. It's just every patient is different. And when you have the opportunity with a new patient, you should take that opportunity to be a comprehensive dentist. So that's the theme of where I'm going with this tonight. And you know, I, I've said in many lectures, I did not coin this phrase, that the major deterrent on the growth of any business is the owner by the owner's own fears, the limits and stories that they tell themselves as to explain they, why they aren't where they want to be. Everybody could use that. Navy SEAL doesn't use that, I guarantee you. A Green Beret doesn't use that. And an elite athlete doesn't use that. They fail. All three of those examples experience failure. They just never use an excuse. Or they wouldn't be who they are. So, one thing I want to say to you when you hear my podcast, or even if you stop listening to me, and you came back tonight, and you're going to stop listening to me again. You need to go back to that cornerstone that got you to where you are to begin with. What am I talking about? You're a dentist. That didn't require many levels of accomplishment that others couldn't do and that you had to prove. First of all, you had to do reasonably well in college. Well, that wasn't easy for most of the people I know. I know some of you just danced your way through college and you got great grades. I met guys like that in dental school. It certainly wasn't me. I really had to work hard, even in college, to get the good grades so I could apply. And then once you got in, do you remember this? You had that incredible first year of taking something like 14, I remember it, 14 courses at one time. And you never thought you'd get through. Some of the courses you had to sacrifice, you couldn't even go to them. Do you remember? You would just study for the midterm and the final. And your colleagues, in many cases, were really, really smart. And it was intimidating, but you didn't quit. And then you had the midterm, second or third year boards. Remember that? And then the requirements and, you know, often being not the nicest, didn't receive the nicest treatment from instructors who, not sure why, looking back, why they were instructors. And then you finished your requirements, but you weren't done. You had to take national boards and then regional boards. And then you totally lost your, you know what? Remember? Do you remember that? Well, you should. Because sometimes to achieve the level of success, whatever it is you aspire to in dentistry, you need to go back and remember what it's like to really dig deep. Some of you don't want to do that anymore. So I'm saying to you, you didn't get to where you are right now 
by accident. You're special. You could be special. And you are to get this far. And I just don't want you to give up because you're burdened with debt or a bad associateship. Or maybe you started out in a business, you made some mistakes, and you got to start over again. And if you're listening to my podcast, I want you to do it the right way. But I want you to do it in a way that nobody could ever look at you with anything but respect. You know, there used to be a clinician, a dentist, a very successful one, about an hour from me that was very well known. He had his own radio show. And this guy was a specialist, incidentally, board certified in more than one specialty. How about that? And I've heard this about other practices before, but what I remember about him is that he was known for sending limousines to pick up his patients. Maybe not all of them. I don't really know. But I know he did that. Sending them roses. Particularly if there was a problem. Again, I know this for a fact. And would often work in his office to really unusual hours. And I think we've all heard stories like this. And here's what I want to say about that. If you can do all that, and you can be profitable by doing that, and you have an outstanding organization that keeps its promises, and that you really truly are a clinician in the higher percentage of what we all would consider elite, and you got that way by training, you're not elite because you think you're elite. You're elite because you've worked for it. And you're honest to say that. Or you're aspiring to be that. That's as that's just as good. Maybe you don't have enough years behind you right now to reach that category. And when I use that word elite, I don't mean that all your work would be capable of being published or on as the model for the cover of a magazine or something like that. What I mean is that your tissues are healthy around your restorations, that there is some rational approach to your treatment planning, and that you make quality good decisions. And sometimes those decisions include you don't recommend any treatment for a patient if they can't treat the etiology of the reason they came to you. I'm not telling you that you turn down extracting a tooth because they won't do an extensive treatment plan. I'm not saying that. I'm saying perhaps you crown eight and nine or seven through 10 when really that patient needs a vertical dimension reconstructed, opened, but they only can afford to do four teeth. I probably have done that in my career. I think becoming a really good dentist is an evolution. So here's what I want to say. I've had two offices in my career. One of them is completely absent of any glitz. It is clean. It is Walt Disney clean. And I believe that's important for you to hear right now. My second office that I've been in now for 14 years is more like a spa. Certainly, there are many, many, many offices that are more glitz to it than my office. And I don't know, I don't have a, a, the final say on what your reception room should look like, except your entire office should be immaculate. That is what becomes important to me over the things I'm struggling to find in my words right now, but I've alluded to to glitz, to fluff. We have quite nice refreshments in our reception room, which have kind of been a parenthesis since COVID. But prior to that, and maybe starting to become more of an item again, we have an, a refrigerator, a lovely refrigerator, a little tiny area, but loaded 
with quality snacks. Now, my refrigerator doesn't just have water in it. It's got juices and things like that. And it's so much so that a lot of the seniors pocket many, <laughs> many of the snacks on the way out. It's true. And I always remind my team that I used to buy flowers for my office every week. And that's okay as long as you are part of an organization where everyone understands the power of a handshake, the power of looking someone in the eye, the power of a smile, the power of asking somebody how they're doing and waiting for the answer, not blocking them out just because it was polite to say, how you doing? Do you hear me? The power of a front desk team that calls people back within an hour because you have a protocol for that. Whether you have a problem, I'm talking about a patient that called in with an unexpected issue that you weren't prepared for, of course. So they called in, a temporary crowns out, a permanent crowns out. And an organization that has protocols for all of these things, and again, I don't even know if I have enough books left in my stockpile to sell you if you wanted them or not. But 15 years ago, that is why I designed the protocol book. I didn't design it to sell my colleagues, which I ended up doing. I designed it so that my team would all be on the same page, that we understood how to handle these things I just started to allude to. Like, how do you open your office every day? Is it random? Sometimes, I know it sounds trite. Sometimes the radio is on, or sometimes around 10.30, you got to remind the front desk, put the radio on. Sometimes the snacks are out. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you check the voicemail on your phone when you walk in, and sometimes you don't. That would be not having protocols. You don't know how to answer a patient, perhaps, with a problem with billing because Susie, the billing person, is out this week because you never learned the power, the lion-hearted principle of cross-training your staff because no one wants to hear when they call in for a situation that somebody's out, they'll get back to you. I know it can be overwhelming when I put it this way. It's not overwhelming. It takes systems. And that's what you have to work on in 2022 and going further. When you do it all the time, it doesn't seem overwhelming. Again, the point of tonight is to accentuate what I'm trying to motivate you to be in your own dental organization, that I'm kind of offended by fluff and glitz. I've always said it doesn't, I don't think how beautiful your office is anything related to uh, case acceptance or longevity of a patient. The hygienic aspect to your office certainly is. You know, it wasn't last week that I would stop with my staff. And, and look, you can do these things proactively and as a takeaway. That's what I always say to them. I'll call somebody and say, listen, do me a favor. Go back into this room. Look at it. Look carefully at the floor. Now, maybe I was looking at a two-by-two two sponge barely tucked away in the, somewhere where it would be hard to see or a some type of wax that we dripped on the floor or something that didn't look acceptable to me. That's my eyes seeing that after 40 years. And I need a team and some that does the same. And so do you, by the way. You not only need a team that does that, but you need a team that doesn't bring attitudes or baggage into your house. That just doesn't work. If you have somebody that is great for three weeks out of four, or to be quite honest with you, is great nine months out of the 12, and that person's probably fantastic in what they do, 
But in your office, it's like a Broadway show. I'm sorry it is, and that sounds ironic with everything I'm saying to you, because I just said glitz and over-the-top fluff that doesn't back up anything. We used to give, everything I tell you comes from experience. So my sister-in-law makes these little beautiful gifts that, I don't know, they cost about $30. And we used to keep a bunch of them under the front desk. And we would give them out whenever we screwed up. And sometimes we gave them out in the beginning of a case. Like we would have gotten a case of significance. And we would, at the end of that visit, when the patient was walking out, we would give them a token gift. That's me telling you this. That's why I'm talking to you right now about this. And that, that is reprehensible to me. Giving gifts is a wonderful thing. If you do all the other stuff, do you hear me? If you give a gift, you know, we do a one day, one week, and one month follow-up on large cases. So again, if you're hearing this for the first time and I'm overwhelming you, or you don't have a pen near you, gosh, I just heard him say he gives gifts, and I don't know, how does he do that? When does he do it? How, 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 where does he get those from? And, you know, they are, they cost me about $25, $30, and I buy 20 of them at a time. We're only allowed, they don't have to ask me for permission, but we're only allowed to present that with someone we've earned that with. And you didn't earn it the day they walk out of your office with the crown and bridge case, the implant case, the all on whatever. You've earned it after a month if they've been back for a couple adjustments and they're really happy. You know when a patient's really happy. Come on. That's when you give the gift, not when you screw up. And I used to preach what I just said to you. And I would justify it by saying, you can't always be on. And you can't. Because we're all working around we're all part of something called the human race and we all make mistakes, right? But do you have systems? And I'm going to end this by telling you how to do that. Number one, your three goals as the doctor that would fit the Navy SEAL slash Lionhearted Dentist would be be a great clinician first. Now that's not enough, but that is everything. And the only way to be a great clinician is to train to be a great clinician. There's many great clinicians, far better than myself, that do not have success that they want because they're bad communicators. So you also have to be a great communicator. And that's a skill every one of you can acquire. You just have to want to acquire that skill. You have to listen to yourself when you're talking to your patients, when you're talking to staff. Sometimes there's literally courses on there, abundant courses on how to do this. And then you have to, you have to commit to being a comprehensive dentist. Now that is your approach. It doesn't mean you get to do comprehensive care all the time. It means that directs your clinical approach. Now, if you have that and really stick to that, then you probably have a pretty good backbone for the lion hearted practice. But the way you reinforce that is with two meetings that you've heard me often bring up, and that's an everyday morning meeting, a meaningful meeting. And I've defined that for you before. Who's coming in today? Anything special we need to know? Anybody from out of town? Any dates that we have promised? How are we doing with that? You get that, because I do. Somebody comes in to me maybe in August and has a wedding in November. It is easy to drop the ball if you don't have systems. The system would be, should be in the computer. And you need to delegate and count on somebody to back you up. It happens all the time with me. And I am not for a second going to hold back to a team that I take very good care of. What does that mean? I pay them very well. 
I'm incredibly flexible with changes in their schedules that they need. Sometimes those changes take a year. A hygienist who's pregnant, who wants to raise her kid for six months or a year, and then come back. That's not easy. It just happened. She's just back, one of my hygienists. To practice in a place, that's the line hard to practice, where you don't have to worry paycheck to paycheck if you have enough money for the team. A place where it's palpable that the patients want to be there. You're not talking them into stuff. They want to be there. Where the disappointments are minimal and delivering more than you promised is more common by far than disappointment. I know it's kind of a philosophical approach tonight, and I also know I'm at 28 minutes. But I felt the need to say that to you, and you can reach out to me, and you could send me some bad email or good email. But sometimes I talk about success in terms of dollars and cents, and that would be misleading of what the lion-hearted dentist practice is about. I'll say it in closing. It's an organization that you put together that the people there, it's probably no, wouldn't take you a second to wonder if the team really wants to be there. That the patients you see each week are almost proud to be part of your patient family. And that you take very seriously your role as the owner of the practice, as the employer of the people that you employ, and as a part of the community in which you practice, and you're a part of that community. Thanks for joining me this week. I hope this resonated with some of you, and I, I know it's probably getting this right after Thanksgiving, so happy holidays. We're not done yet. We've got a lot more to talk about. Thanks for joining me.